that really interesting overview of polio, post polio, and German late effects to polio. And it sort of sets the talk up nicely for me to discuss the role of the EF therapy in allied health and some of the sorts of common presentations that you might have for these patients when they come to see you in the clinic. Um, so, in my presentation today, I thought, and there will be a little bit of overlap with Steve's talk, we perhaps should have discussed this a little bit more closely before no, no, that's good. I'll be discussing whether or not polio is still actually an issue in Australia today, um, and as an allied health practitioner, what you're likely to encounter. So, we'll look at the signs and symptoms both of polio, the late effects of polio, post polio syndrome, and then think a little bit about the assessment considerations that you might give these patients, and also what treatment options are available to you. So, if we're thinking about whether or not polio is still a problem in Australia, in living memory, obviously there's been more episodes of polio in Australia, but in living memory there's really the two major epidemics, and they were in the early 30s and the early 50s. So those patients that survived those epidemics are now in their late 60s through to their late 80s, and those are the Australian patients that I'm talking about. The last known case of polio that was contracted in Victoria, and I know we talked about that person coming back on the plane, but the last actual contracted episode of oh, case of polio that was contracted in Victoria was in 1979. So she's now in her mid to late 30s. So there's still young people around. And the last known case in Australia was in 1986. There's been a global effort to eradicate polio, which began in 1988 and was led by the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the Rotary Foundation. And these efforts have reduced the incidence of animal diagnosed polio by 99% from 350,000 cases in 1988 to fewer than 2,000 cases in 2006. In 2000, so we're talking relatively recently now, polio was officially eradicated in 36. Western and Pacific countries, which includes China and Australia, and Europe was declared polio free in 2002. Um, according to the World Health Organization, in 2013, polio remains endemic in three countries still, so in Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's right. But I think that the thing that people always get a bit confused is the difference between endemic mm -hmm. and, 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 and and not being around at all, yes. right? So endemic simply means that it's never been eradicated from those three countries. It doesn't mean that polio is not found in other countries mm -hmm. where it's reinfected those countries because mm -hmm. they've, they've um, either decreased or stopped that state in those countries. So they've never gotten rid of them from those three countries. <coughs> but it is, at any given stage, it could be in 20 countries, mainly Africa. And what this means for us as a, as a physio working in practice, and certainly for me, the majority of patients I see have had polio, but if you're out in the general community and someone's referred to you, if they're an immigrant to the country and they're from Nigeria, Pakistan, or Afghanistan, or even a, a third world country and they've arrived here relatively recently and they've been referred to you because they've got weakness or other associated symptoms, you still need to have in the back of your mind, is this a person that could have been exposed to the polio virus? Mm. And just as an aside, when I started working for Polio Services Victoria, which came about when the Fairfield Hospital shut down mm. and the services were transferred to St Vincent's, we had about 900 patients on our books. Mm. I've actually just gone back to St Vincent's in the last few weeks, not working directly for Polio Services, but in conjunction with them. I was having a look at their numbers last week, and it's up around 1,300. Mm. And that's primarily, well, partly there was a little bit of sort of... Um, wow a reawakening or, or people's interest in attending a clinic again after years of not having been to Fairfield Hospital. So we've got a few new local referrals, if you like. But there's been a lot of immigrant activity. So interestingly, the average age of the patient is gradually at this stage coming down, but I imagine hopefully that will sort of start to increase as polio is, is eradicated. So as, as Steve has outlined for us before, polio itself is a neurological Disorder. So the patients that present to you will present with lower motor neuron signs. That is, that they'll have a flaccid paralysis. And in the acute stage, um, that, that's a sort of full body flaccid paralysis. But as they recover, they'll, through that axonal sprouting, my, my picture is not as good as yours, I'll have to, <laughs> have to have a look at that. But if I can show you here. So we've got an anterior horn cell, an axon coming down here to supply the motor unit. And if that axon dies off, as a result of the polio, then that 
motion new, or the remaining motion neuron that hasn't been affected can send out new sprouts. And it's through that sprouting that you get some of the, the recovery from the polio and um, return of some strength. I've put this um, sort of red flag marker here, is I do occasionally have patients referred to me who, who tell me that they've had polio and they also include sensor, sensory signs and symptoms. Now if anyone's telling you they've got sensory change with their polio, it's not actually polio. And they need to be referred on for further sort of investigation as to what's happening. What do you mean? Oh, so like if they, if they say to you, oh, I'm, I've got no feeling in my arm. Oh, so uh, Yes. So you're really, you're really thinking about some spinal so, mm -hmm. issue? Yeah, something else is going on. I mean, they may have had polio, but then something something else is happening which needs to be investigated yeah. if they've lost the, the feeling of touch. Um, the, other, the other thing is, as um, Steve was pointing out earlier, is if at university you're taught, well, the effects of polio are only low motion neuron, but it has been shown in post-mortem studies of patients, and this was, this was actually done quite a long time ago, over 50 years ago, that there are actually um, changes seen within the, uh, the midbrain, and that's the reticular formation, which might therefore have some impact on the, the, the sort of fatigue that patients um, complain of with the deep nuclei of the cerebellum, which might um, account for some of the proprioceptive deficits that they have. Also within the vestibular nuclei, which might contribute to any balance deficits that they have, and within the hypothalamus. So it's obviously a neurological condition, but it affects more of that within more systems within the body than just the neurological system alone. When you're looking at these patients, you need to take into account their cardiorespiratory system because it's very common that they might present to you with deconditioning. And this is a bit of a chicken or the egg thing. They may present with decreased exercise tolerance, but you need to ask yourself, is that as a result of their decreased ability to mobilise? Or have they got a decreased ability to mobilise because they're deconditioned? So actually it's through assessment that you'll have to try and nut this out and sort out what's going on with a particular person. They can also have compromised ventilation, either through kyphoscoliosis or through scoliosis, which reduces their lung capacity. They may actually have a weak diaphragm or intercostal muscles, and that can result in poor cough. And so it's worth getting these patients having lung function testing. As a physio, you're not necessarily referring for that, but you're working in conjunction with the medical staff to make sure that they have a, a, a full screen. And the other thing is also they might also have sleep disorders, especially when there's the history of the vulvar polio. And I think that's a term that's commonly used to describe uh, polio where the, the muscles of speech and swallowing have been affected too. And then of course there's biomechanical and musculoskeletal considerations for people who have polio. They can have pain, this has been described before. Um, and as a physiotherapist, that pain, the, the patients report complaining of pain often come from a vertebral origin and it might be as a result of a radiculopathy or a neural dynamic problem, especially where they've got a scoliosis or a leg length discrepancy because obviously that changes the alignment of your spine and the spinal anatomy over time. They often come with um, changes in their shoulders, hands and wrists as musculoskeletal as a result of osteoarthritis or wear and tear of joints, especially if they're heavy crutch users or they have been using manual wheelchairs for a long time. And also they might have overuse syndrome such as carpal tunnel syndrome affecting their hand. They do sometimes get joint contractures and that's predominantly seen in the foot and ankle within the sort of otherwise fit and healthy Australian polio population. I have had a couple of patients come as immigrants to the country, one little fellow from Africa who had never been able to get up and walk. Um, and he had crawled his whole life. And so he came to us as a 10-year-old with a sort of multi-degree collection of the um, And also another girl from the Middle East in a similar situation where she had sort of been crawling to get around. So that's unusual. Um, it's usually foot and ankle that's, that's affected by contractures. And there are a few other sort of, which I just bundled into the other issues, um, Category. There are a few other problems that these patients might present with, and that is that there are high falls risk. And I think when you've got underlying neurological and musculoskeletal changes, it's not surprising that, that you might be unsteady. Those patients with vulvar polio often present with dysphagia and dysphonia. They can have chronic or persistent pain, and as we've already discussed, these patients tend to be overdoers rather than underdoers. 
There can also be an issue with weight gain and obesity, um, and that's a really difficult sort of issue that's already been discussed and a difficult one to try and solve for these patients, especially when mobility and exercise is difficult for them. They may have also have poor abdominal and or abdominal and or pelvic floor strength and dysfunction. And sometimes that only comes up um, incidentally in conversation. It might be an issue that they've been struggling with for years and haven't felt comfortable to discuss. And so you need to sort of have that in the back of your mind and um, refer on if they, if they need help in that area. And the other, the other issue that's a really big one, I think, is psychosocial considerations. And that is, this is a group of patients, especially the, the patients that have contracted polio in Australia, who have become acutely unwell as infants or toddlers in a time when um, the management of this infectious disease was to isolate you from the rest of the community. So these are babies and toddlers who have been removed from their families, put into hospitals and institutionalised care for numbers of years before they then return to families. And they, and especially as a physio, I think physios were very unpopular in those times or did unpleasant things to these children. As a physio, um, especially when you first come across these patients, it's understandable that there's a certain degree of hostility. And that was one of the biggest issues that I had when I started working for polio services is, is preconceived ideas about what I might do or my thoughts on things and also the fact that um, I hadn't had much exposure to polio patients at that stage, and so I was really learning off them as to what to do. But that's that's quite a big issue to, to try and overcome. Um, and also, the, this is the group of people who, or the, the older Australians are in a group, who are now at a stage where they're finishing up successful careers despite sort of facing um, significant disabilities throughout their life. And they're entering a phase where they perhaps are less mobile and are needing more assistance. And looking at that transition into accepting more help and care, whether it's in the home or even looking at residential care. And it's quite a big issue for them to overcome. And actually, part of why I'm back at St Vincent's at the moment is looking at, um, at employing or the feasibility of employing a social worker to start working with Polio Services Victoria as well, because that's quite a, an area that's um, been identified as needing ongoing ongoing need. So I thought what I'd do now is just briefly touch on the terminology that we've, we've been using. And I know we've discussed the, the sort of diagnostic differences between post-polio syndrome and the late effects of polio, but just look at it in terms of what symptoms you might see. Now, I've put the photo here of this fellow who's got Gina Rikovatan, or hyperextension of his knee, and that's a very common presentation with people who've got weak quadricep muscles. So what they, they tend to do is, in order to get some stability at the knee when their thigh doesn't work, is they push it back, whether it's using their glute muscles, using their calf, or actually just using body mechanics to allow that. And that then gives you some inherent stability, providing you keep your weight back, and you can then stand on your leg. But obviously, over time, it stretches the posterior structures of the knee. And the other issue is, if you think about the joint on the inside, you've got the big surface of the tibial condyle and the big surface of the femoral condyle that should distribute weight evenly over that joint. Mm -hmm. Now if you're pushing your knee back in the direction that it's not supposed to mm -hmm. take weight through, you're reducing that surface area that weight is distributed over, there's increased pressures and you get sort of marked wear and tear of the joint in the front and that can become acutely painful and is a really difficult thing to then try and manage and treat um, and we'll get into that in, the, in just a little bit. So if we're looking at the late effects of polio, they're basically the effects that are, um, that are secondary, con secondary conditions related to the residual polio damage. So it's a result of musculoskeletal imbalance. Um, so the weakness itself in the limb, if you're not then mobilising properly on your leg, for example, can cause growth retardation or slowing of growth in the polio affected limb, so you get leg length discrepancy. If you're not getting good weight bearing through that, then you can get also osteoporotic changes in that bone um, and respiratory insufficiency. And there can be secondary trauma, a bit like I was talking about, to, to joint lines if you're um, not weight bearing evenly through joints, compression neuropathies and overuse syndromes. But there can, there's an exhaustive list of things that can be counted under the symptoms of late effects of polio. If we're talking about post-polio syndrome, there's obviously been a history of polio, a period of partial or full recovery, followed by a lengthy possible period of stability, and then a 
reduction in function which can't be explained by the secondary complications. They usually present with new muscle weakness and or atrophy, fatigue and pain. And so really between the between the post-polio syndrome and the late effects of polio, there are some common issues that you'll encounter as an allied health professional. And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily um, matter what is causing the weakness or fatigue or pain or functional change. With your assessment skills, you should be able to tease some of that out. But your treatment options for, for all of these are reasonably similar. And actually, I've included this little picture here of these children lined up on the boards. And you often have patients, when they're recounting to you their history of polio, that they were strapped to double Thomas splints or had a period of immobilisation. And so I thought I'd just show you a little picture of what that looks like. And sometimes if, if your arms were affected too, it would include having your arms strapped down in the sort of crucifix type position. Um, and that could go on for months. Um, so, as you can understand, they weren't necessarily that pleased with their physios. Um, I, I have several patients who have yeah. tendon hammer phobias. Because mm. every day they've got tapped mm. twice a day. Mm. Oh, yes. So, it's pretty traumatic to them. Yes. yes. So, in terms of what we do as allied health professionals, I think the real key to treating these patients successfully is doing a thorough assessment. Now, in an ideal world, it would be a multidisciplinary assessment. And for patients in Victoria, they have a multidisciplinary team of Polio Services Victoria that have a doctor, a physio, an orthotist, an OT, and hopefully soon a social worker as well, um, assessing people's needs. Out in the community, we're not necessarily so lucky to have all of those people on site at one place. But as a treating therapist, you need to keep in the back of your mind that this is not just simply a, a sort of unidimensional problem. There's lots of layers to, to the issues that um, polio survivors have to deal with. So I think when you're assessing a patient, you really need to take a good history of their polio. And a little bit um, how we were outlining further earlier, if you know about the severity of the initial illness, the age of onset, the amount of recovery they had, and the amount of physical activity that they've been able to participate in the intervening years between when they had acute polio and now, it will give you some idea as to um, whether or not it's post-polio syndrome as an issue that we're looking at or the late effects of polio. You then need to do a thorough neurological assessment, and I think that's really important, especially as a, um, as a physio working in the area of polio. I think, oh, well, everyone that's referred to me, of course, you know, they'll have polio. I don't need to look sort of too specifically at the issues going on there. But I would say once or twice a year, you do get patients who refer to you that have obvious upper motion neuron signs or something else going on. And so you just need to be acutely aware of that and choose it. I'm terribly sorry, Louise, just to interrupt. A car needs to be used quite urgently. The ZFV, it's a white car with a green P plate. Um, so a neurological assessment is really important. And then as a physio, I put strength testing there. So manual muscle testing as a way to gauge someone's baseline level of strength is a useful thing to do. And it goes in, in and out of vogue as to whether or not to do this. Um, as someone that's worked in the area for 15 years, I tend to do it so that you've got a baseline record of where the patient's at. Um, and it means, you know, if they come back to see you in five years, you've got some way of trying to quantify whether or not their strength has changed or not. I think it's mandatory. Yes. Mm. I think the, the other mm. thing with strength testing is at university you're told, okay, when well, you look at, you know, strength of elbow flexion, you test that just once. Mm. And I think the other thing that's useful to test in polio patients is actually to repeat the strength testing, especially if they say if they come and say to you, and it's often quads or glutes or one of the big muscles that holds you up, um, I'm feeling weaker in this muscle. And I think if you actually test it ten times, you'll find by the time you get to number five or number six that things are starting to change. And by the time you get through to doing it ten times, that that it gives you a clearer idea of what's going on. And then obviously, you know, if you have access to other disciplines within your clinic, it's worth having swallowing and speech assessments and video and horoscopy, especially if there's been vulva involved. Uh, my specific area of interest at the moment is gait analysis, and as a physio, I work in a clinic with an orthotist, primarily looking at gait problems in people who have polio. Um, and I'll show you some video in a little while it's taken in a gait lab, but you don't need to have a fancy gait lab to actually look at look at a polio patient in your setting. You can use 
a simple video, you can do things like 10 metre wall tests. Um, and the other things that we tend to do in our clinic uh, look at and take a, a falls history and also take the patient's weight. Um, and that's partly, partly as a baseline measure to sort of see where that's headed because obviously if they can try and maintain their weight um, or even in some cases reduce it and take pressure off limbs and, um, and ligaments that are trying to hold the person up. But it also when I work closely with an orthotist in prescribing um, but then also we determine what kind of joints and accessories are available to, put, to build into their brace to give them as much function as possible. And I'm assuming that Natasha later on is going to talk about um, work and home place assessments and psychosocial assessments. So, approaches to treatment. Basically, therapy for people who've had polio is the same as the therapy that you can provide to other people within the community. But you have to have done a thorough assessment first to have a good understanding of what's going on and analyse the patient holistically. But you also have to re-evaluate very frequently to make sure that what you're prescribing and treating the patient with is actually being effective and not doing harm. You also need to try and predict the likely consequences of your treatment choices. And what I mean by that is, as a physio, let's say, you have a patient coming to you with lower back pain. Now, if I was in the outpatient department of the hospital and someone came with lower back pain, I might think to treat it with nose. And you'd mobilise the back, they'd feel better temporarily, they'd go away, and this might happen sort of over a course of several treatment sessions. With polio patients, you sort of have to take a step back and think, okay, well, what's causing the pain? Is there legal discrepancies here? Is there, you know, is it a radiculopathy? Is there a scoliosis? So you actually have to sort of look a bit closer and mobilising their back may not actually affect any change this patient in the long term and you have to sort of think about using the other things that are at your disposal to help them manage their problem. Now I'm going to go through weakness, fatigue and functional change separately to just sort of discuss some of the um, things that you need to consider when you're, when you're treating these, these aspects with these patients. In terms of weakness, Obviously, if a person comes to you and they've had plastic paralysis of their leg for that, you know, ever since they've had polio, you're not going to change that. But there might be a case in which either there's new weakness and you want to see whether or not targeted strengthening is going to change that weakness if it's as a result of deconditioning. You might be putting the person into a new orthotic and you want to actually train up a specific movement to enable them to engage or disengage a particular component or joint that you've put into that brace. Um, so there are times when you want to actually provide a polio patient with strengthening exercises and probably up until about 20 years ago that was a real no-no because people were told if you exercise, if you do strengthening, you're actually going to make your weakness worse. And I think, you know, if you if you approach strengthening like a bullet a gate and you do too much, then yes, you are going to make the weakness worse because I think it puts that motor, new, motor unit under pressure. Um, so I've just put up there, in normal strengthening of a patient, you're increasing their muscle strength through hypertrophy. Hertrophy. You're placing the muscle under load, you repeat that, you get increased muscle bulk, increased neural adaptation, so you get a much stronger and more cohesive contraction. In a polio patient, we've already said that they've got these giant motor units that are now trying to innovate the muscle, and they're already performing at an enhanced level. So if you place further demands on that giant motor unit, you're potentially going to fatigue it and then damage it. But there is some small efforts, um, a small amount of evidence now starting to show that you can exercise this group of patients safely, providing you follow some certain guidelines. And I quite like this um, quote that I've taken from an article by Dean and Danny Moore that says, non-fatiguing muscle training in conjunction with rest, has a role in the management of individuals with post-polio syndrome. Indications and exercise prescription parameters are based on detailed history and assessment of the client. And I, and I think that's true. I think provided you've assessed the patient and you have a good understanding of what's going on and you understand why you're going to prescribe the exercise, you can do it safely, providing you monitor these patients closely because I think there is a risk, or there is a risk, of worsening muscle weakness and fatigue if you exercise excessively. 
if you prescribe 10 repetitions, you prescribe 10 repetitions, not 20 or 30. Yeah. You actually need to ask them how many times they do it, because I'll say to you, I could do that, so I thought I could try and do a few more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And being very concrete with this group, and yeah. starting out extremely slowly with extremely small numbers of things to do. And I'll get to that in just a tip. So you have to think, why are we going to do exercise or strengthening exercise with polio patients? And there's a large number of reasons why you might want to, perhaps to improve or maintain the strength that they have. You might have determined through your assessment that they're fatigued, partly through deconditioning, so that you actually want to have a trial of exercise to see if you can improve their energy levels and their endurance. You might want to do some stretching to maintain muscle length and some strengthening of, a, of the muscle on the other side of the joint to help maintain that length. You might think some activity might help improve their sleep patterns. It might help improve their mood if you want to add in some weight bearing to reduce risk of osteoporosis. And sometimes you'll be referred to these patients as they've been newly diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension or obesity and you're needing to help them exercise to help maintain a comorbidity. And finally, I've said you might do targeted strengthening and that's something that I do quite a bit of. When you're putting a patient in your, into a new style of orthotic, you want to make sure that you're strengthening and training up a particular set of muscles that will allow that orthotic to work. So, principles of safe exercise. You need to be really sure that you know why you're prescribing those exercises to the patient. It's not just a global thing that you generally say, that you do, sort of saying, you know, you're going to do 10 squats and 10 it, 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 Yeah, it's not, it's not just handing them the general deconditioning exercise sheet that's at the back of your mind, okay? You need to appreciate the potential benefits of the exercise versus the possible side effects of doing the exercise. You also need to take into account the joint condition of both the polio and the non-polio affected limb. And that's sort of thinking through, you know, degenerative changes of joints and other things. And if, if weight bearing is an issue for these, for that particular patient, you might try and think about other mediums of exercise, whether it's hydrotherapy or something that's non-weight bearing. You need to start the program really gradually, include short rest periods during the training, and also rest days in between the training, and make sure that the patient understands that this is a, is a safety uh, precaution to make sure that we're not actually going to over-stress that muscle. The resistance needs to be kept low, and you need to monitor the response of the exercise, and particularly be aware of pain and fatigue. And I'll just want to have a quick look so I know we're not all physios and not all OTs and things in the room here today. So how you monitor an exercise, um, it needs to be performed without increasing overall fatigue levels or overusing muscles. And a sign that it's too difficult for the patient is they may say to you that their limb feels really heavy or they can't lift the weight that you've given them. You might notice there's a reduction in the quality of movement. And what I mean by that is, you know, you give them a dumbbell to lift and they're trying to lift it up and after two or three, you're getting jerks at the muscle and their body's bending with it. You might get quivering or flickering of the muscles. Other parts of the body start to work harder to compensate for that tired muscle. And they might have changes in their facial expression. They might be bruising or jaw clenching. So you need to reassess not only how they're performing during that exercise, you also need to assess their response to the exercise. So when they finish, are they still fatigued? Do they bounce back quickly? Like, do they, you know, after a five minute rest, do they feel comfortable to move again? Um, and you then always need to reassess your objective measures from your initial assessment um, to compare with what you're, what you're exercising at the moment. Now, I'm just going to quickly look, there's obviously a couple of types of exercise. You can strengthen skeletal muscle, um, and you can also strengthen cardiovascular system through exercise. So, with skeletal muscle, there's, there's very few articles that specifically relate to polio and exercise that are done well, but one that I quite like is by Chan et al, who looked at actually hand, um, hand and upper limb exercise in a polio group. And they found that using using the sort of general guidelines of low resistance, working up to high repetitions, I'd say, not starting with high repetitions, with frequent rests, um, provided them with the best outcome. So in their study, they were using um, three low resistance sets of eight repetitions with five minute rest between each exercise. And this is not a prescriptive guideline that you use with the patient. You have to obviously assess who you've got in front of you. They did this exercise three times a week, <coughs> 
with a rest day in between each exercise day. And they were able to show over a 12-week period that they could have an increase in muscle strength without damage to the motor units. Now, cardiovascular training, this is a slightly more tricky area. Um, these patients, there's no high-quality evidence to sort of show, um, to, sh to, to give you guidelines as to how to do this safely. So <coughs> from general practice and with other physios that have worked in the area of polio, these are the guidelines that I follow. Um, I know that excessive training can exacerbate fatigue, and so what you want to do is gain fitness without worsening it. So start at a moderate level of intensity, have short sessions with frequent weights, allow adequate time for recovery between sessions, and you can use a walk scale during the exercise to sort of determine that they're not, they're not working too hard, or just ensure that they're able to speak to you um, in full sentences without... Um, so speak to you with full sentences during their exercise so you know that they're not working too hard in the first instance. So um, from this study here by um, Kritz and Jones, they used 20-minute sessions with frequent short breaths during it as needed three times a week and were able to affect a, a change in the cardiorespiratory fitness of their patient, their polio patient group. I've just put this slide, and I'm mindful of how we're going, I've put this slide in um, about hydrotherapy because it can be used as another medium within which to do strengthening exercise. And there's obvious benefits because of buoyancy and hydrostatic pressure, you're held up and you have reduced weight bearing through your limbs. Um, you can use the waters with um, uh, turbulence to provide resistance to your exercise. For a lot of patients, this um, weight relieving environment provides some pain relief. It's, it's a good medium for those patients who have cold intolerance. You have to assess those patients that have heat intolerance as to whether or not it's effective. And it also enables you to do some um, assisted target task practice. So walking in the water unassisted, practicing going up and down stairs before you try it on land. Um, and for most people, it's enjoyable. Some people have a real aversion to swimming, but those who like it, it, it provides a good, a good medium in which to do it. Now, we've talked about weakness and strength here. Fatigue is um, one of the most debilitating symptoms that the polio patient will tell you that they've experienced. It's a sense of weariness that can be experienced in varying degrees, but is different to normal tiredness. It's disproportionate or unrelated to physical activity. So as a physiotherapist I think it's important that when someone presents to you with fatigue that you keep in the back of your mind that it's multifactorial and can be um, influenced by a number of things, the amount of physical exertion they undertake, any sleep disturbance they may have, medication they're taking, depression, poor diet, stress in their lives, chronic pain and any other comorbidities. And that if you can't attribute the fatigue to something specific, that you refer back to a rehab um, specialist or their GP to further follow that up before you start trying to, to treat it. Um, so once you've had those symptoms thoroughly investigated, oh, actually, just as an aside, when I was working at St Vincent's, I was interested to look at fatigue in this patient group because there wasn't a lot um, when I came into the job that, that outlined how many people in the population were affected by it in what ways. And so I did over a six month period just a snapshot of the patients that attended our multidisciplinary clinic. And from that, 50% um, of the people that responded to the survey um, experienced fatigue daily, 32% were waking feeling tired, 29% were feeling fatigued by late morning, and 16% felt that their fatigue began in the evening. And of those who reported fatigue, 85% have been experiencing it for more than 12 months. So it's not something that sort of is just transient and you know, comes and is there for a short time. It's something that these people are living, living with. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking as an allied health provider, how do we help these people um, manage it? So I asked them, had they tried any strategies that had worked for them in terms of coping with it? And the top four that they reported back were taking naps throughout the day, mm -hmm. reducing the types of activities that they were doing, receiving help from others, and using aids and equipment. And sort of building on from that and looking at literature from other areas, um, I was able to sort of come up with a list that provides a sort of mainstay of patient education that we give people about being aware of the time of day and the duration of their fatigue and then planning their activity and rest around that. 
um, ensuring that you schedule enough breaks and give yourself enough time to complete tasks, prioritising activity, delegating where possible, which I think this patient group is loath to do, but sometimes it's required. Um, pacing tasks when energy is available, so not trying to do everything all at once. And being respectful of the signs of fatigue and responding accordingly. Now, this brings me to the last part of my talk, which is looking at functional change in patients. So residual deficits of polio, such as muscle paralysis and joint deformity, can cause major issues of pain and loss of function. And for me as a physio, the major loss of function that I see is in relation to walking, although I'm sure Natasha could talk about work and home um, and ADL type loss of function as well in her session. Um, the major issue with functional change is when it starts altering walking pattern and more seriously leads to falls. And at that point, um, these patients should be coming and seeing a physio and orthotist. Falls are the leading cause of injury related deaths in people in Australia over the age of 65. And people with pre existing conditions such as polio that have muscle weakening and associated joint pathology are more predisposed to falls. And injury following falls in these groups are likely to lead to more catastrophic loss of mobility and loss of independence. So it's vital to prevent these where possible. So you need to once again take a thorough assessment of the types of falls they're having. And I have patients that say, no, oh, I don't fall that often. And when you ask them, it's only three times a day. And they say, oh, but I've learned to fall over the years, so it's not a real problem. Um, so you really need to ask them how often they're falling, what's precipitating their falls, can you pick a common pattern? And so the trigger sort of things that I think of when I'm asking them about environmental facts at home, things like flooring, lighting, furniture, electrical cords being around, looking at stairs and steps, do they have rails in their home to sort of assist them with that, and looking at the environment outside the home or their workplace. And there's obviously behavioural factors involved with um, falls. So thinking about risk-taking behaviour, ensuring that they've got well-fitting shoes, mm -hmm. And interestingly, when you look at polio patients where you've got a leg length shortening, you've also got a small foot often. Now, some patients will choose to wear split size footwear, which gives a good fit. Others will like to wear the same size shoes on both feet and will have toe fillers, but that can, if they're not fitting well, lead to trips and falls. So you need to look at their shoes and make sure they're fitting well. Providing gait aids, if you think that's useful, and then teaching them to maintain their gait aids, their rod stoppers and brakes them to avoid purring and have regular health checkups. So looking at their blood pressure to ensure that that's not contributing to the falls. They've got um, good eyesight and that there's no medication side effects that's contributing as well. And you need to think also for those people that are regular fallers who are insistent on still walking whether or not getting them a set of few protectors is a good idea. Sorry, can I just interrupt? There's some, one of my volunteers um, in polio's, polio survivor, yes. as you would imagine. And, um, and she comes in on a scooter or, or a wheelchair, and she, because of that reason, she chooses not to wear the orthotics that she's got. Um, but as time goes by, I'm, I'm actually observing her. Um, yeah. So she'll get up, she's got two walking and she'll furniture walk, you know, to the short period that she needs to go. Um, I am very concerned now. Um, about, you know, like one day she's going to fall down and she's a big woman, so I don't know that I'll be able to help her get up. Um, but that seems to be the other problem. They won't wear orthotics if they're in their yes. mobility aids. Yes. 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 yes, so, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a issue going on there. So I think it's sort of talking through with people and getting them to understand what each bit of equipment or assistive device is for and the types of things that you can and can't do with it safely and understanding risk taking behaviour. And I'm going to show you a video in just a second and talk about that a bit more. Um, so this is my second last slide. So, so what if there is a major joint instability or weakness which is not responding to treatment, or there's long-standing joint deformity, or they're having recurrent falls that don't seem to respond to your treatment? Well, you might need to, to think about orthotics, and they will help assist with control of movement, correct or prevent joint deformity, help compensate for muscle weakness and in some cases improve energy efficiency. And I truly believe that fitting an orthosis um, can only occur effectively if you have some follow-up gait training with it. Um, and that needs to be in a in a in very close teamwork between an orthotist and a physiotherapist. So I'm just going to show you hopefully, let's see what happens, a video. 